Again, good morning. And as we prepare our hearts and our minds to hear a word from God this morning, would you join me in a brief moment of prayer? Gracious and loving God, we come before you this morning, gathered together from different places, but gathered as one heart, as your children. Come together this morning to praise and to worship you. And we cry out to you to hear a word from you this morning, the word each of us needs to hear. And may all of our ears be open enough to hear that word. And may our hearts be soft enough to be transformed more into the likeness of your son, Jesus, each and every day. And we ask all of this today in the name of your precious and your holy son. Amen. Well, good morning again. And may I wish you a happy Mother's Day. And I wish that to all of you out there this morning. And I know some of you are like, well, wait a minute, I don't have any babies. Well, I would say happy Mother's Day to you too. And some of you are like, hold on a minute. I'm a dude, man. Well, I would say happy Mother's Day to you too. And I'm going to tell you why I say that to all of you, regardless of your situation this morning. We're going to take a look at Mother's Day uh, this morning, maybe a little differently than you're used to, because I don't think we think big picture enough of motherhood, at least not according to scripture. We need to celebrate wonderful and beautiful things this morning, but it might be a little different and a little bigger than what you're thinking. To do that, we're gonna take, gonna need to read a little bit of the Bible to help us define and put a definition on the word motherhood. And I think because if I ask you all to put a definition of motherhood in the comments this morning, it would be almost unanimous. Almost everyone would include something about having children. But I don't think biblically that that definition would be complete or completely accurate. So we're gonna start with a fall of man in Genesis three. And I know that may seem like a strange place to start on Mother's Day, but hang with me, we're going somewhere with this this morning. You see, God created the world to function perfectly, to function correctly. Everything in a rhythm, everyone with a part. And the world is a beautiful place, it is paradise. Everything God created working perfectly together. And then sin entered the world. How? Well, Adam and Eve were taking a walk in the garden one day and Eve has a conversation with a serpent. And during that conversation, she takes a bite of the fruit. And then she hands it to her husband, Adam, and he takes a bite of the fruit. Now notice with me that Adam is with her the whole time. I think sometimes women take a lot of grief for this, but Adam was right there with her the entire time. And then God comes walking through the garden for their daily walk and he's asking for and looking for who? For Adam, not Eve. He's not blaming Eve. He blames Adam. In the New Testament too, the apostle Paul says, therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man, and in that moment came the fall of mankind. Everything that was beautiful and perfect and good and right became fractured and broken. Wine gave way to drunkenness. Food gave way to gluttony. And we can go on and on and on. And all that God created as pure and perfect spiraled out of control. And God said to them, because of your sin, here's what's going to happen. And he turned to Eve and he said, I will greatly increase your pains in childbearing. With pain, with pain, you will give birth to children. And all the results for the woman seem to revolve around having children and children in the home. Then God turns to Adam, and interestingly enough, all the results for the man seem to revolve around work outside of the home. And he says to Adam, cursed is the ground because of you. Through painful toil, you will eat of it all the days of your life. It will produce thorns and thistles for you, and you will eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your brow, you will eat your food. So after everything has been broken... That's where we're going to pick up this morning in Genesis 3, verse 20. 
a very interesting verse to me. And here's what it says. The man called his wife's name Eve because she was the mother of all living. You hear that? The mother of all living. Why is that so interesting? Well, let's go down to chapter four and continue. Now, Adam knew his wife. Now that word knew right there, that's new in the biblical sense. And that's all the explanation I'm gonna give you on that. You'll know as we continue reading. Now, Adam knew his wife and she conceived and bore Cain saying, I have gotten a man with the help of the Lord. And again, she bore his brother Abel. Now Abel was a keeper of sheep and Cain a worker of the ground. Now what's so interesting about that? Let's think about that for just a minute, shall we? Put these things together. Let's do the math. Adam calls the woman Eve because she's the mother of all things. And yet she doesn't have what? That's right, children. She does not have children yet when Adam calls her this. She's called the mother of all living before she has children. So to me, it seems that motherhood is more comprehensive and maybe deeper than physically having children. Now hear me, hear me, be very clear. I am not shortchanging or diminishing the role being a mother to the children that you have had. In no way, shape or form am I shortchanging that or diminishing that. In no way am I taken away from that. But I do believe that when scripture calls her the mother of all living before she has any babies, that maybe, just maybe there's something going on here and there might be something intrinsic in the woman that makes her motherly before children enter the world. So let's go back even further. Genesis chapter one, verse 26 and 27. Then God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over the livestock and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. So God creates man in his own image image, male and female. He picks up some dirt, molds it together and he forms a man and then he breathes life into him. And then when Adam could not find a suitable help, a suitable helper in all the earth, God knocks him out, takes out a rib and makes the woman. And although, although they are every bit equal, equal in the imagery of God, You cannot argue that they are uh, unbelievably distinct in their creation. God wanting to display the width and the breadth of who he is creates the man and then creates the woman. And as a rule, as a rule, generally speaking, even though they are equal in the imagery of God, there are some differences between the two. Generally, Men are designed to be physically stronger. I know, I know you can give me examples uh, where that is not necessarily true, but generally men have been created to be physically stronger than women. Now, God creates women with some very unique attributes as well. Physical attributes that the man does not possess. And I I know I'm going to get in trouble for this, but God made women's hips rounder and he makes their body just a little bit softer. And he gave them breasts for a purpose in most cultures for raising children. And I think back to when my daughters were babies, there were nights that they would wake up. One of them would wake up in the middle of the night crying. And when I would go in, Um, Sometimes, no matter what I did, it wouldn't help. I'd pick them up, I would rock her, I would pat her back, I would feed her, I would sing to her. And after I would cry out to Jesus for help, after a couple of hours, nothing would work. She was upset, and being upset then made her more upset. But as soon as Joanna would come into the room and take her, 
in just minutes, she would begin to quiet down. Why? Joanna would pull her in close and the softness of her skin, the softness of her voice, the softness of her body would make our little girl settle down and slip back into a deep sleep. I really think that God makes the woman anatomically as a comforter, as a nurturer, softer she is, quieter she is, more gentle she is. So the Bible calls Eve the nurturer before she has children. Motherhood, more than about just having babies, although that is a huge part of it, was going to be instead about the role of woman and how God created the world to function. Now let's be very, very clear. Hear me when I say this. I am not talking about women being meek, little, mild creatures that can't get out of the home and all they do is meant to clean house and to do the dishes and to cook dinner. That's not what I'm saying at all. I'm married to a very strong and independent woman, yet she is very nurturing and nourishing and comforting. Both of my daughters, young, strong, independent women, but very nurturing and compassionate. So that's not what I'm saying at all. But scripture does tell us that God nurtures us by speaking truth in love. And sometimes that can be very aggressive. So how does this work itself out? As we talk about Mother's Day today, sometimes the scriptures are very clear. If you're an older woman, you should be nourishing and nurturing younger women, whether they're your children or not. I would even say to women of all ages that they also have a role in nourishing and nurturing men, young men and children into godly men. When that guy starts throwing game at you girls and he's not godly, but he's in, he's that church guy, but he's not godly, confront him and say, listen, I think you're cute, but here's the problem. I'm looking for someone who loves Christ because if they love Christ with their whole heart, They'll love me like Christ loves the church. And you're just not there yet. So I'm out. Don't get me wrong. You're a good looking guy, but you need to get to know Jesus a little better. And I know that sounds harsh, girls, but that's actually being nourishing and nurturing to that 25 year old guy who spends all day on the PlayStation 4 with no job and living in mom's basement. So, Let's, let's not stop at just celebrating our own moms. Don't get me wrong. We'll celebrate Mother's Day. In my home, we will celebrate Mother's Day. We'll celebrate Audrey, Joanna's mother. And we're incredibly grateful for her and all that she has done and continues to do. And we will remember my mom and be incredibly grateful for the time we had with her and all that she did. And we'll celebrate the women and and the woman and the mom that she was. We're incredibly grateful for both of our moms, but, but we need to take it further. The triune God says, let us make man in our own image, both male and female in our image. So in the female attributes of nurturing and nourishing and mothering, we have an aspect of the character of God the character of God that is not so easily seen in man. This side of God that he communicates, that God communicates to us through woman, a nourishing, encouraging, life-giving part of the character of God. This is God displaying himself to us. So we celebrate mothers. Absolutely, we celebrate mothers because because of Christ in them and because of what Christ is communicating to us about himself in them, gentleness, compassion, sensitivity. And before you start yelling at me this morning, I know that's not all women. We live in a broken and a fallen world, but in the way that God created this world, this is what it was. And so I'm grateful for the time I had with my mom. I'm grateful for my mother-in-law. 
I'm grateful for both of my daughters, Caitlin and Casey, and I'm oh so grateful for Joanna, my wife. And I'm grateful that when my wife puts her hand in mine, that her hands are so much softer than mine. I'm so grateful for all of their compassion, all of the women in my life, for their compassion and their nurturing and their nourishing. And I know this morning, I kind of been all over the map with this and my prayers this week have been all over the map. And I know some of you want to have children. You want them so badly. And I would say to you, well, then come on, mother us, mother. It's what God created you for. Mother, please, mother. It's how God wired you physically, emotionally, mentally. Of course you want to mother. Then mother us. And then there are some that have a hard time forgiving their mom. I think maybe, just maybe it's time to let go. I'm betting that she did the best that she could with where she was. Nobody's perfect. That's why all of us, every single one of us need the cross. And then there are those of you who are doing this so well, mothering so well. So we should celebrate it. But above everything else, I pray that we could really spend some time really thinking about God reveals to us about himself, about himself in our wives, in our daughters, in our sisters, and in our moms. What's God telling us? What's he saying to us? May he be praised for the display of his perfections in the mothering gifted to us in women. Gracious and loving God, that we thank you today for this special day. We honor and we celebrate our mothers, but may we make this bigger. And biblically, may we honor and celebrate the women you have gifted and your character shows in them. And may they take those gifts and that character and mother and nourish and nurture all of us so that we may grow in our godliness and our likeness of Jesus Christ. Lord, thank you for your word this morning. And thank you for the gift of your son, Jesus Christ on the cross and the resurrection and the work that was done there. In his holy and precious name. Amen.